yeah, thanks for coming along and thanks Kimbo for, for hosting. Um, so just to introduce myself first quickly, um, I'm lead developer advocate at uh, Project Calico Tigera. Uh, formerly I was a Calico user in a previous role and I just uh, really liked the project. So I kind of fished for, for uh, to be involved in the, in, in the team and here I am. Uh, I like to change this uh, obsession every time that I post uh, this slide. So today's obsession is Christmas mince pies, uh, which I really like, uh, which don't contain any meat, strangely. Um, and I'm always looking to, to learn and share and connect. Um, so, you know, get in touch and I'll share my contact details at the end of the presentation. So, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's chat. Um, so hopefully you know what Calico is, but um, if not, then um, the Project Calico community uh, and Tigera develop and maintain um, Calico, which is an open source uh, networking and network security solution for containers, virtual machines, and <clears throat> host-based workloads. Um, sorry, all three of my monitors just informed me that they, they're going to turn off in a minute to save power, which I really don't want them to do, so just fixing that. Um, so here's some details. We have more than 6,000 people in our Slack, uh, more than 150 contributors, and more than a million nodes are powered by Calico every day. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there are lots of ways to get involved and contact us, but um, the Calico users Slack there is a particularly good one. I'm very active on there, and, um, and uh, as are many other users. So uh, get involved. So what we're going to dive into today is to quickly talk about background knowledge um, and prerequisites. Uh, why we're diving deep. Um, I'm going to show you how to check the basics on a cluster and um, take you through a theoretical packet flow. Um, then we're going to look at some tools for visibility and debugging on our EBPF, EBPF data plane. And then we're all going to, we're going to see all of that uh, on a real life cluster. So <clears throat> from a background knowledge point of view, on such a short session, I wasn't able to um, go into eBPF itself um, or to, to teach you how to build a Calico eBPF cluster. The reason I haven't done either of those things is because there's a lot of really great documentation out there about both of those things. So um, if you are unclear what eBPF does, then, then obviously um, come back to this session after, after you've learned about that. But I think you'll pick up quite a lot here as well. And our, our documentation does a really good uh, good job of giving a basic example of how to build an eBPF cluster. Um, it's surprisingly straightforward to convert uh, a vanilla cluster to our eBPF data plane. Um, if you want to try this on your own cluster, um, you can just follow along and see what I do today. But if you if you want to, um, to build your own eBPF cluster, um, then you can convert any um, cluster to an eBPF cluster. And you, you just need to go to docs.projectcalico.org and those three links there. Um, I think we'll probably be sharing a recording for this session later. Uh, those three links there will take you um, to the resources that will tell you how to do that. So I won't take too long to dwell on this, but why, why dive deep at all? A, clus a cluster usually just works, right? So why, do we, why take the time? Well, um, it enables you to diagnose your own problems um, and to get a deeper understanding of how it works. Uh, and it improves support as well, um, uh, commercial or open source. In, in an open source scenario, if you're able to frame the question well um, and give us the information we need, um, then it, you, you get a much better chance of, of the kind of reply that will help you out. So I think it's beneficial. So let's just uh, dive straight in. So the first thing I thought I'd focus on is checking the basics. Um, I wanted to show you the mistakes that can generally cause, I'm just seeing a chat. Uh, would these demos work on a kind cluster? I will, uh, Jerome, I'll come to that point uh, in a short time when it gets, there's, there's a point at which it's best to discuss that actually very soon. Um, so I'm not gonna show you every setting to enable an eBPF cluster because the documentation does that. What I am going to show you is how um, there are a few settings which result in a suboptimal cluster rather than a non-functional cluster. Now, what I mean by that is with these settings set incorrectly, the cluster may still work with the eBPF data plane, um, but the performance will not be what you'd expect and you might have other issues. 
So the first one of these is that you need this sys um, BPF file system mounted on the nodes. And that is uh, where um, it gives persistence to the BPF map data. Now, um, this is really important. This, uh, this blue um, mount point here is really important because if you don't have that mount point set, the BPF cluster will continue to work. But when the um, data plane restarts, um, you will get a longer than necessary service interruption. So I've been discussing internally with the team um, <clears throat> whether we may change this to become a hard requirement that if this file system is not mounted, then, then maybe we should not spin up the, uh, the eBPF data plane. Um, the second part of this is that you need a supported Linux distribution. So Ubuntu 2004, Jerome, uh, Jerome um, Red Hat 8.2, um, or another supported distro. And if you uh, go to our documentation, you can see the full list. Um, and that's to do with both uh, with the, the kernel version and the headers. So the short answer to your question, Jerome, is it depends, um, but you, it, you will need to have um, met the requirements defined here. So as long as you have that file system mounted and you're running a new enough kernel version um, and the headers are built into, into um, your distribution, then it will probably work. Uh, if you want to be 100% sure it will work, then it needs to be one of these distros. Um, so some other basics quickly before we dive deeper. Um, you need to have a kube proxy either fully disabled or um, in the event that you don't have kube proxy disabled, you need to, uh, you need to use this um, configuration flag, BPF kube proxy, IP tables cleanup enabled set to false. And the, uh, out of those two settings, the preferred one is to disable kube proxy. Um, and the reason you just don't, can't do that in all scenarios is because um, because in some scenarios like K3S, uh, kube proxy is actually built into the main binary and so it can't be disabled. And in that scenario, you use the BPF kube proxy uh, argument. Uh, the final um, basic that I wanted to highlight, uh, and I'll show you these on a real cluster later, um, is that the, your encapsulation should be, a, should be VXLAN or no encapsulation at all because IP and IP encapsulation is not highly performant with, uh, with our eBPF data plane. So let's take a, a step into more detail, a theoretical packet flow. So what we're seeing here is not our eBPF data plane yet. What we're seeing here is the packet flow in um, NetFilter through a single Linux host. And this includes a Kubernetes node. So this diagram is courtesy of um, Jan Engelhardt. This is an amazing diagram. Um, but what you'll notice is that there's a large section in the middle with the input path, forward path, and output path. And the majority of the um, standard IP tables uh, Calico data plane is implemented in this green box. And the reason for that is because this green box represents the layer three processing on a Linux uh, node. And so you can see that NATs happen here um, and uh, post routing that and so on. Um, however, BPF programs are attached in different places. They're attached here at the XDP eBPF hook, um, here at the ingress queue disk, and here at the egress queue disk. So we're able to attach eBPF programs in the Linux kernel at the start of the flow and at the end of the flow, but not in the middle. So all of the eBPF processing happens either at the start or the end of the flow. And you can see eBPF can sidestep the whole um, uh, net filter flow. Now, um, eBPF programs are attached uh, at these points and those are called queue disks, um, they're attachment points. Now there are some queue disks, uh, in particular, there's one called the class axe queue disk. Uh, is it shown on this diagram? No, it is not. Um, and that is a, an attachment point for attaching an eBPF program to, um, to do arbitrary work. Now the uh, class act QDisk is 
of what's called a no-op Q disk, which means that it doesn't perform any action at all. It's simply an attachment point if you wish to attach your programs. So the programs that are attached at, um, uh, are compiled at build time. And the per node agent, um, Felix, the Calico per node agent, uh, attaches to the policy programs at runtime. Uh, then the pre-compiled programs jump to the policy programs. I'll show you more about that. So at ingress, you can see that the packet is received and then it goes through the, uh, if we go back, essentially we're seeing this part of the diagram zoomed in. Now, um, some BBF programs can be attached at the XDP hook here, but the majority of the eBPF policy happens here, attached at the TC ingress uh, tree of QDisks um, and the class act QDisk. Now, this leads back to a previous point I made. Um, you might recall that I said kube proxy needs to be disabled um, for our eBPF data plane. And the reason for that is because um, kube proxy is implemented inside this green box here. So in order for our eBPF program to be able to uh, do the Calico forwarding, um, it needs to uh, work alongside the kube proxy functionality. And it's, uh, it's difficult to interleave the eBPS pr program functionality and the kube proxy functionality. And as a result, it was necessary to replace the kube proxy function functionality in Kubernetes with the eBPF fun uh, functionality, essentially to rewrite that functionality in eBPF. Um, fortunately, uh, rewriting that kube proxy functionality in eBPF actually allowed our dev team to make some improvements. Um, so actually we have some features that Kube proxy does not, and uh, I think I'll go into that later in this in this presentation. So at the egress, um, we have a similar scenario. Um, Netfilter post routing happens, and then we attach our eBPF uh, programs here. Now um, we can attach. Those eBPF hooks that I showed, uh, if we dive back to this diagram, essentially these hooks here at ingress and egress can happen on any of these red lines. So hopefully if, if you take this to be a Kubernetes node, this should clarify slightly that we apply eBPF programs on the ETH0 um, physical interface, ingress and egress, on the VEF interface, and on the peer interface for each workload pod. And the traffic is still routed normally through uh, IP tables and the FIB. Just checking my notes to see if there's anything else I should point out. Um, the ingress and egress programs are attached at Kali, data, and tunnel interfaces. Other interface types are handled as exceptions. I should make that point, yeah. IP and IP tunnel interfaces and WireGuard interfaces are handled as, as exceptions. Um, so we pass the packet on ingress. Um, we check the connection tracking map and make sure it hits um, and uses, uh, and if we could, sorry, we check the connection tracking map and if we get hit, well, then we use the, the available information and we take the fast path, uh, which is represented by the red in the diagram. Uh, if the connection track misses, then uh, the first packet goes through IP tables, RPF and routing, and then the final BPF program uh, writes back the, uh, oh, sorry, the initial BPF program writes the BPF map that will be used for the next packet in the flow. Um, the policy program uh, does the processing of um, network policy, and then we jump to an epilogue, ep epilogue program uh, at the end, which actually um, wraps up the flow. This diagram shows uh, the same thing, essentially. Um, it's just a different diagram. I, I felt like it showed it in a different way, so I thought I'd include both. So to restate, the first packet for each flow will be processed as usual. Um, your policy is converted into the eBPF bytecode. 
um, stored in the eBPF maps um, here. And they refer to IP set maps, which contain IP addressing. Uh, the logic to implement load balancing and packet passing is pre-compiled. Um, and uh, and re relies on these IP sets. Uh, the policy programs are dynamically generated. Um, and then the epilogue program wraps it up. So I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, we have quite limited time. So I'm going to show you a live demo and we'll show all of these tools in that live demo. Um, so I just want to give you the key points at the moment. Um, these are the tools you would use if you wanted to get a deep dive view of the open source version of uh, Calico's data plane. Uh, eBPF data plane, I should say. So we, first of all, we have a tool called Calico BPF. Um, it's a tool to examine um, Calico's eBPF maps. So if we just jump back quickly, we talked about how uh, eBPF stores <clears throat> data like IP sets in, uh, in maps, which we consider to be uh, data storage. Calico BPF allows us to examine them and to manipulate them. So the kind of things that are stored in eBPF maps are the up table, uh, connect time load balancing programs, connection tracking, IP sets and routes. And Calico node uh, runs within, uh, sorry, Calico BPF runs within the Calico node pod. So we run it by using kubectl exec in the Calico names, uh, system namespace. <clears throat> The name of the Calico node that we're interested in, and then the command. And I'll I'll give you live examples of this. So um, this command, as with so many Kubernetes commands, it doesn't really roll off the tongue, but but when you see it live, hopefully it will uh, stick. We can get a lot of information. We can see from that we can see the whole flow end to end. Um, the next tool I wanted to highlight was TC. Um, TC is not specifically for use with Calico. Uh, it's a, um, TC is a tool for um, showing and manipulating traffic control settings, but it allows you to view um, the uh, queue disks and uh, to, to view and manipulate traffic control settings. Uh, it can be used to see if an eBPF program is dropping packets. So if we have time, we'll do that live in a moment. Um, on this one? No. Okay. Um, the next tool I wanted to highlight was um, our eBPF program debug logs. So these are the logs generated by Calico. Um, and that warning is really important. This has a significant impact on program performance. So you shouldn't turn this on on a production cluster. Uh, if you're getting to the point where you feel like you need to do this, then it's a great time to come and talk to us on the Calico users Slack um, and, and, and we can help you to debug. Um, but nevertheless, I will show you how to do this on, on, on my cluster in a moment. These logs are extremely verbose. Um, they give you the PID that triggered the network new API poll, um, which CPU number it's happening on and, and so on, uh, and some flags about the kind of uh, event that we're seeing. Okay, I, I flew through that because I wanted to have plenty of time to demonstrate this on a live cluster. Um, as a result, we've actually ended up with enough time. I think I need about 20 minutes and we have just over that. So we have time uh, if, if anyone wants to go back over any of that content um, for me to speak in more detail or has any questions, now would be an okay time for that. And if not, I'll just push on. Is there anyone want to ask question to Chris? If no, he can move with the demo. Yeah, it looks like it's looks like it's yeah. okay. To yeah. ahead. So okay. All right, so let me show you what I've built. Um, this is what we're going to examine. So we have a five node cluster. Um, we have my laptop at the top. My public IP is different than that, actually, um, but you'll see it in a moment. Um, obviously, in my home ISP changes um, its IP. Uh, I'm connecting 
to a TCP connection to a GCP load balancer. Um, again, that IP is different because I've, I've torn down this environment and rebuilt it, but the port, address, port is the same. And we'll actually see uh, load balancing forwarding me to a node port on one of the nodes. Now, we have no way of knowing which node I'll end up on, but the, the important thing is that I'll be forwarded to, to this node port running on one of the nodes. That program will make a forwarding decision. Um, and it will refer to the eBPF maps. Then I'll be VXLAN tunneled across to the node that's serving the workload, which is uh, answering on port 8080. Um, and then the ingress and egress queue disks that we showed, that processing will happen here um, on the physical interface of the node, as well as on the pods uh, VETH interface pair. And then we'll see a direct server return to the client. So notice that that return traffic doesn't go back through the ingress node as it conventionally would with Kube proxy. Um, so let me keep that diagram handy and I'll show you the cluster. Just find my documentation, here we are. Okay, so first things first, uh, if we look at our nodes, we can see that uh, it's been up for a day and a half and we're running up-to-date Kubernetes. Uh, we have a master and three uh, workload nodes. And I just wanted to show you quickly how to check those prerequisites, first of all. So I can SSH to any of these um, nodes. That. So I'll, I'll arbitrarily choose node zero, but, but in a production environment, if you were unsure, you'd want to check all of them. So we SSH to one of these nodes. And really the only things that we need to check to make sure that we're running a compatible environment is the kernel version, uh, which is 5.11 in this case, which is definitely new enough. And we need to make sure we're running a supported distro. So in this case, 2004, so that's it. So as a result of that, we know that we have the required eBPF um, functionality uh, on this node. The next thing we need to check, as I, uh, as I showed earlier, is that we have the sys uh, FS BPF file system mounted. Wow. <laughs> So you can see that we have, a, if we run mount, we have a ton of mount points. Uh, so let's run something a little bit more readable. If we grep for sysfsbpf, you can see that the file system is mounted and it's type bpf. Um, we don't need to check these permissions particularly. It's a little, it seems misleading that this says none, but that's fine, that's correct. Um, if you're familiar with mount, uh, I used to know how to read this, but I can't quite recall anymore. But the key point is, this is fine. This is what you're expecting to see. Um, the bad outcome would be that you have no, um, is that you have zero lines of output. We, we have one line uh, essentially showing it's mounted correctly. So you would run those checks on, on all your nodes to make sure that they're being built in a compatible way. And provided you have that file system, um, then your nodes are, are compatible. The next thing we need to do, and the next most common, um, misconfiguration is that we still have Kube proxy running as I described. So um, if you still have Kube proxy running on your cluster alongside the eBPF data plane, things will continue to work, but you'll see very high CPU utilization. And that's because Kube proxy and the eBPF data plane are fighting for, um, uh, fighting over the IP tables rules. So we need to make sure Kube proxy is disabled. So the first way we can do that is to simply look at the output and we should see that we have no Kube proxy running and I'll show you how we disable it. This is all in the documentation for when you build a cluster. But um, it, 
In Kubernetes, you'll be familiar with the concept of a daemon set, um, which specifies that you want to have a workload run on every node. And that's how kubeproxy conventionally runs. So there's in the kube system namespace, there's a daemon set called kubeproxy. And you can see that it's not running, which is what we want. And that's the case because we've applied this non calico equals true node selector. So if I run a describe command, I'm describing that daemon set. You can see that uh, the node selector has non calico equals true. So what we're basically saying is we only want kube proxy to run on any node that doesn't have calico on it. E.g. we don't want kube proxy to run at all. Um, so that's how we disable it. Um, as I mentioned before, if you had a cluster type, for example, K3S, where you're not able to disable it, then you just um, edit your Felix configuration. So if I just uh, scroll up and show you that more carefully. Um, there's a custom resource called Felix configuration, um, which defines how Felix is configured to behave. It's called default. And if you were not able to disable kube proxy, then you would actually add the flag that I shared earlier um, with the really long name, which I never remember, uh, which instructs, uh, what that does is it tells um, Felix not to tidy up the IP tables rules that are created by kube proxies proxy, but simply to ignore them. Um, okay, the last thing I wanted to show here before we move on to the next part is that you'll notice VXLAN enabled true. And this is uh, to make sure that we have the VXLAN encapsulation between nodes. And um, again, if you had IP in IP encapsulation, things would work, but the performance would be poor. And that's because if you recall, you might recall um, IP, IP interfaces, I mentioned how, the, uh, how they were handled as an edge case uh, in the BPF data plane. Um, okay, so the next thing that we need to, to look at is um, the Kubernetes API. And I wanted to explain in more detail uh, about that. So, Kubernetes presents a bunch of services um, by default. And one of those services is called Kubernetes. It's in the default namespace. It's a cluster IP, and it's actually the uh, Kubernetes API. Now, the thing to know here is that in a vanilla cluster, it's actually kubeproxy that's responsible for presenting this cluster IP. Now, there's a gotcha there. And the gotcha is that um, on each node of, of a Kubernetes cluster, Calico needs to speak to that API. Um, but of course, we just said that we need to disable kube proxy. So we can't disable kube proxy and have Felix use kube proxy to talk to the Kubernetes API. So the crux of it is we need to change the configuration of uh, Calico to tell it to talk directly to the real workload endpoint of the API rather than talking to uh, this cluster IP. So if we describe that cluster IP, you'll see that it's a cluster IP running in the default namespace. You'll see that this is the um, cluster IP and the cluster port, cluster IP port, but this is the real endpoint. Um, the real workload endpoint 2.73 on port 6443. And if you look again at the pods, 2.73, 6443. Whoops. Um, there you go. You'll see that the kube API server is running there. So what we're really doing is, is instructing Calico to talk directly to the uh, Kubernetes API. And we do that. Um, it's already been done on this cluster. But there's a config map 
in the uh, Tigera operator namespace called Kubernetes Services Endpoint. Now the Tigera operator's job is to deploy Calico's uh, per node agent and to bring it into conformance with a uh, target configuration. So what happens is we create this Kubernetes services endpoint and we specify the real uh, Kubernetes service host and port. And as soon as Felix, <coughs> uh, the per node uh, Calico agent sees that configuration, it will restart the daemon um, and the Kubernetes, the Calico daemon and speak directly to the Kubernetes API, at which point we can stop the uh, kubeproxy service. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a live demo <clears throat> of the actual um, eBPF rules in the BPF maps. So the way I'm going to do that is, first of all, I'll show you some policy that I've created. So I'm gonna, I've got some uh, network policy applied. Um, the first thing I've created is a network set called IP allow set. And IP allow set is, uh, applies a label, again called IP allow set, and that label set to true. It has an IP address, and that IP address is my current public IP address. We'll check it in a moment. And then we basically say, if you're in that list, you're allowed to access anything you like in the default namespace and anyone else is denied. So let's just confirm that my public IP address hasn't changed. So we curl check ip.dynedns.org and we can see here's my public IP and we can see it's a match. All right, so um, I'm going to show you First of all, this command, which looks pretty hairy when you first see it, but I'll explain it bit by bit. Um, what this command actually does is it's a for loop and it grabs the names of all of the Calico node pods. It prints out the names of the Calico node pods and some and a divider, and then it uses the Calico node um, binary, and it passes these arguments, and it dumps the BPF IP sets, and then at the end it just does some grep uh, to manipulate to get a, to get rid of some uh, some unnecessary output. So it looks like a funky command, but what that does is. It shows each of the five nodes and it shows the IP set. I'm sure you'll immediately notice that this IP set, which is a eBPF map, is only present on one of the nodes. And the reason for that is, is pretty cool. If we look again at our pods, we can see that there's only one workload in the default namespace. And we can also see that the, well, uh, we can see that the, the node that is aware of this IP set is this one XP, XPT. So if we have a look again, we can see that this is the only one that has this IP set in its programmed into its eBPF maps and it's node two. And if we look at our production workload in the default namespace, you can see it's also on node two. So what's actually happening there is that the only node that has bothered to program the IP set into its data plane is the node that knows that it has a workload in the default namespace. So we can prove this by applying some more workloads into the default namespace. And straight away, very quickly, if we run straight away that forward command again, as quickly as I could, you'll see that now four out of five of the uh, nodes have this IP set. 
So why not five out of five? And the answer is because if we look at our nodes again, this one is the uh, master. And because it's the master, it doesn't have any um, nodes in the default namespace running on it. Pods, excuse me. So you can see that everything running in the default namespace is on the other nodes. None of it is on the master. So, so that quick command lets us see, for example, the IP sets, but it would also let us see all kinds of other eBPF maps, and that lets us see what's happening on the node. So let's see some other cool examples of that. Um, this command looks really uh, crazy, but again, it's it's actually a variation on the same command. So it sets two environment variables, which is the IP that we are interested in and the port that we're interested in, 8385. Uh, so if we go back to the diagram, it's that port there. And it uh, SSHs to all, four, all five nodes, and it prints out the BPF connection track table and greps for the interesting IP and the interesting port. And that's it. So if I run that command straight away, as expected, we see no output. And that's because we're interested in seeing connections to our echo server pod, this one, from this IP. And there is no connection because I haven't made one yet. But if we curl that now, let me show you in full actually. So I have a look at my services. We can see that the IP is 35 ending 207. So let's curl that. Okay, so we immediately get a response from the echo server. And if we run that command again, hmm, we actually had a bit of bad luck. We got, uh, if we go back to the diagram, our flow actually came in on the same node that happened to have the echo server pod. Um, let's run it one more time. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So this time you can see that we have four connection track keys. And those connection track keys are being stored in the eBPF maps on this node and on this node. And you can see that there's two keys, one and uh, two, two keys per node. And in this data, if we dig into it, we can see the pod IP and port. We can see the external source port. Uh, we can see the um, where is it? Somewhere here we can see the VXLAN. Oh, there we are. We can see the VXLAN tunnel IPs. And all of that, we captured the whole flow. So if we go back to this diagram, we have captured the whole flow through the cluster with one command. So this is quite a powerful command. Um, okay, we've got just about the right amount of time. I've got two more things to quickly show you and then we can shift over to questions if there are any. Um, so the first thing I wanted to show you quickly was um, about looking at the counters. So, um, let's say we have a concern that a policy is not being processed properly and we want to prove whether the drops are even happening on the interface. So again, let's look at our echo server pod. We can see that it's running on node two and we can see that its IP address is 217.70. So first of all, let's SSH to node two.
And the next thing we need to know is what which interface is dot, dot 70. So if we uh, look at the routing table, we can see that two on seven dot 70 slash 32. This is the um, workload pod that we're interested in. And it's this is the VETH pair. So all that remains to do is to have a quick look using TC like this. I mentioned TC earlier, show the QDisc, QDiscs for that device. And we can see that um, the class app QDisc, which is the no op QDisc that I mentioned, we can see that it's got five drops, which means that as well as the legitimate traffic that I've been sending, um, there's been five attempts to connect to that port. Uh, now, those were actually me yesterday. So I'm going to quickly um, grab my phone, and I'll, which I've taken my phone off the Wi-Fi. So we should find that if I quickly try that URL again, this one, colon eight Now, before I press go on this, there's a chance this may not work. I've noticed Google Chrome do some really interesting things on my phone um, where it doesn't connect out properly, but let's give it a go. So my phone's trying to connect to that URL and failing because it's my phone is on 4G and it's not coming from the same source IP address. So in theory, if we check these counters again, oh, there we go, perfect. You can see the drops have incremented. All right, there's just one more thing I want to show and then uh, we'll have just a few minutes of questions. Um, and that is the logging. Now, this is the logging that I mentioned that you that we shouldn't turn on on the production cluster. Um, but turning it on is just a case of uh, adding an extra stanza to this Felix configuration. So if I attach my Felix configuration like so, and I'm adding a value called BPF log bevel and setting it to debug. That's it. It's as easy as that. And then uh, if I run this debug command on any node, um, sudo tc exec BPF debug, then I get the debug logs. Now this looks crazy, and the reason there's so much going on is because if I control C that, you can see that the destination port is port 22, <coughs> SSH. So all this traffic is actually itself being evaluated. It's evaluating the SSH session that I'm connecting to the host via. Um, but that, that being said, these, these logs are incredibly verbose, um, which is why you shouldn't turn this on in a production cluster. But you can see this is a connection tracking lookup um, being uh, hitting an existing rule, and we can see the uh, hexadecimal source and destination IP addresses, and so on. Let me just turn off that debugging while I remember. Cool. Um, so, uh, uh, Mario's got a, a question. I'll just answer that in one second. Um, so, Mario, just before I answer your question, um, just to give to come back to this final slide, I just wanted to um, to uh, give you these contact details so you can make a note of them. This is uh, my personal Twitter, LinkedIn, and Slack, and so on. Um, so I'm very happy to to you know chat if any of you would like to. So you asked what's actually stored in the BPF maps. Um, let me go back to my slide, which lists or oh, my my notes, I should say, which lists all of the components that are in there. I think it's back here. So Mario, to answer your question, the eBPF maps store the IP sets, but uh, there's a blog post I wrote uh, that answers this question really well. I'm avoiding answering incorrectly because I won't. I know that I'll miss one or two if I don't uh, check this myself. Uh, 
Um, okay, so the IP sets are stored there, but we knew that. So the NAT front end and back end information um, for load balancing and packet parsing is stored there. Um, and I think, yeah, here we are. Um, you can also see uh, the connect chime load balancing programs, IP sets, and NAT tables and routes. So I think that's everything that's stored in there. Uh, Jerome has a question. <laughs> Jerome's saying it didn't work for him. Um, so Jerome, you asked a really great question. I'm gonna publish a blog post, hopefully in the next few days, about building um, a BGP uh, and um, Kubernetes and Calico IP tables data plane cluster in Minikube on my laptop. Um, I had quite a lot of success with doing that. And I tried adding eBPF to that cluster and it didn't work because the Minikube um, ISO doesn't contain the necessary BPF um, uh, headers and so on, even though it is running a late enough kernel. Um, so if you wanted to build it yourself, if you're happy to do so in the public cloud, that's gonna be the quickest way. Failing that, um, if you look at the eBPF course that I released in the last few days, uh, if you search for uh, CCO L2 eBPF, which is the Calico eBPF uh, course, you'll find that there's some instructions in there about how to enable the eBPF data plane on a vanilla Kubernetes cluster on VMs. And in my course, I described doing that in GCP, but there's no reason that you couldn't do it uh, on your local host. Um, if you can't get that to work, just um, uh, if you can't that, get that to work, then just um, get in touch with me on Calico users. Uh, if you need to make it. Oh, fantastic. Um, Francis has just posted a, um, Francis has just posted a link to potentially getting BPF re ready in Minikube. I did look into that briefly. Uh, thank you. And uh, Jerome, here is the course ID that you asked for. Um, so, So I put that in the chat, but let me also actually, I don't know why I don't just show it on my screen. So if you, um, if you have a look here, you'll see. Uh, we have this new certification. Um, so if you go to the Tiger our website, you'll see this here. Uh, it's an eBPF certification. It teaches you about what eBPF is, how to enable it, some of the content that we've just covered. Um, so yeah, I think it should be helpful for you. No worries. Um, Mario, I see your question about how IP routes coexist with the BPF maps. I'm going to be honest, I don't think I understand it in enough detail to give a definite answer now. Um, perhaps we can talk on Calico user Slack because I, I don't want to give the wrong information and I'm not quite sure how that how the relationship works. Um, so yeah, maybe we can take that one offline. Uh, Francis, let's have a look. Yes, that's right, Francis, correct. Um, an eBPF map, um, so Francis is making the point that an eBPF map can store any kind of uh, data. It's just that the Calico data plane chooses to store the, these part, these pieces of information. Um, so, but this also relates to Mario's point. Um, if it's storing routes in the eBPF maps, how does that relate to the, to the normal routing table? And the answer is, to be honest, I'm not totally sure. So I think we need to take that one offline. Cool. Uh, we already used up all of my time. So unless there's any really quick questions, I think we should um, uh, hand over because I'm interested to see the next session.